Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a basic introduction to the program comprehensive meta-analysis. Our website is www.metaanalysis.com. My email is michael at metaanalysis.com. This particular video uses uh, an example that focuses on the difference in means in two groups. We have other videos that uh, use binary outcomes and that use correlations. Uh, let me point out at the beginning, there's a, um, an icon up here that allows you to activate this interactive help system. Um, most of the information that I'm going to be covering today is the same as the information included in the help system, and so I'm simply going to turn this off. The basic idea, uh, you open up the program, you're presented with this uh, grid that sort of looks like Excel, and you need to insert columns into the grid that are then going to be used for entering the data. The first thing we do is we say insert column for study names and the program inserts this column over here and calls it study name and for the sake of argument the first study might be Cooper so we'll enter that. That's Cooper 2000 and that's going to be our first study. The next thing that we need to do is to insert a column for effect size data. Now one of the really nice things about the program is that it allows you to enter data in many different formats. And since it does that, the first thing that you need to do is to tell the program what kind of data you want to enter. So when you click uh, the way that I did a second ago, insert column for effect size data, the program opens up a wizard and um, the instructions are over here. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use this wizard to specify the kind of information that you want to enter. We click Next and the program has four options over here. Uh, for the time being, let's just click the first one which is comparison of two groups, two time points, or exposures, and this includes correlations, and then we click Next and the program gives us sort of this uh, bookcase of different kinds of information that we might want to enter. There's a book for the economist data, which we're going to cover in a different video, continuous data, which we're going to cover over here, correlational data, rates or events uh, by person years, or survival times. I'm going to click continuous data, which is means, and then the program lists four different kinds of studies that might have been uh, used to give us information about means. Um, the most common one is unmatched data, unmatched groups with post data only. There are other ones that have uh, matched data or pre-post tests and then some other ones as well. I'm going to click unmatched groups post data only and now we're down to the lowest level of this hierarchy where we have two studies that gave us data about two independent groups and at, at this point all of the uh, formats within here apply to that, but the point is different studies might have given us this data in different formats. For example, a study might give us the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for each group, or it might have given us, uh, for the sake of argument, simply the sample size and the t-value for, uh, for the analysis. I'm going to pick this one, which is the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for each group, and down here I click Finish, and what the program does is it creates a the kinds of columns that we're going to need to enter this kind of data. Before going back to that, the program over here allows me to label the different groups. So the name for the first group, it says, for example, treated. And by default, it calls that group A. We're going to call that treated. And the name for the second group is control. We're going to call that control. And click OK. And up here you see there's a column for the treated group. We can enter the mean, standard deviation, and sample size. And then for the control group, we can enter the mean, standard deviation, and sample size. And finally, there's a column called effect direction that we'll get to in a minute. So let's assume that the treated group has a mean of 110, and the control group has a mean of 100. The standard deviation in the treated group was 20. The standard deviation in the control group is 20. The treated group has a sample size of 100. And the control group has a sample size of 100. For effect direction, we're going to choose auto. 
which means simply that we're going to take the treated group mean minus the control group mean 110 minus 100 so that the raw difference is going to be, in this case, it's going to be positive. As soon as I've done that, the program comp computes for me the standardized difference in means, um, which, we which we generally call D, the uh, bias adjusted standardized difference in means, which we call hedges G, and the raw difference in means. So for example, the raw difference in means is simply this minus this, that's 10 points. The standard error of that is 2.82, and the variance of that is 8. Um, for the standardized difference in means, uh, D, that value is 0.5 with the standard error and the variance. And for hedges G, that value is 0.498 with the standard error and the variance. One um, additional thing you can do with the program is if you want to find out how any of these numbers are computed, you can simply double click on the computed value. So for example, over here, I wanted to find out how the standardized difference in means was computed. I double clicked on this, and the program, first of all, shows me the formula. And then additionally, down at the bottom, actually plugs in the numbers from this particular study and shows me how it came up with the values of 0.5 for the standardized difference in means and 0.144 for the standard error of that value. Similarly, if I double clicked on any of these other ones. Um, I could get that over here. Uh, there's actually a tab over here corresponding to each of the effect sizes. So I can click on hedges G and see how that value was computed or the standardized difference in means. And uh, similarly, I can now go ahead and enter information for the remaining um, studies. One thing that um, is worth knowing is what happens if I have a second study over here that used a different format for um, for providing for reporting the data. In other words, rather than giving me the um, the means uh, standard deviation and sample size for each group, it uh, it gave me maybe only the um, the t value and the and the sample size. And let's say that study is Hedges 2002. What I can do then is I simply come back over here, I say insert column for effect size data the same way that I did before. Um, in this case, this, the, the data is simply a sample size and a T value. I click finish. And what the program has now done is it's given me columns to enter that kind of data, the treated group sample size, the control group sample size, and uh, a T value for independent groups, and again, an effect direction. In that case, let's say the uh, treated group has a sample size of 50, the control group has a sample size of 50, the T value, let's say, is 2.5, and the effect direction, we'll say, is positive. And by positive, uh, that means that it's going to take the, um, the, 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 uh, standard, the standardized mean difference and put a a, um, a, posit a, a plus sign in front of it. If I had selected negative, it would put a minus sign in front of it. Uh, and since the way we've set this up, a positive mean difference means that the treated group did better, right? That's what we saw over here. So because I've put a positive sign in front of this one, it means that the T value represents um, a case where the treated group did better. Uh, down here, the program has now uh, added tabs, one of them for independent groups. So if I click on that one, I see the columns for um, entering data for, um, for all of the information for independent groups. If I click on this one, I see the columns for entering information in the form of a t-test and sample size. Actually, if I click, I can click on either one of those and get the columns that I want, or I can click on either one of these and get the columns that I want. Um, as a matter of fact, I can right-click in this space and click Show All Data Entry Formats, and you'll see what's happened. This is, if you think about Excel, where you have the option of hiding uh, sets of columns. The program has a set of columns over here for the first data entry format. It has a set of columns over here for the second data entry format and we can add a third and a fourth and so on. It doesn't really matter which format we use for entering the data. The only thing that's critical is that as we enter these columns over here, 
the program is using this information to compute the statistics out here. It's the yellow columns that are being sent to the analysis and it doesn't really matter um, which format we used to enter the, the data. The reason that we hide these columns generally is because if we don't do that, the yellow columns scroll off the screen and it becomes harder to manage this. But at any time, as you see over here, I can go ahead and redisplay all of them. So I'm going to say uh, show only the current data entry format and this is what happens. Notice also that when I entered the mean standard deviation and sample size for each group, the program was able to compute the standardized difference in means and it was also able to compute the raw difference in means. By contrast, when I entered the uh, T value, the program was able to compute the standardized difference in means and it was able to compute hedges G but it could not compute the raw difference in means because it doesn't have the information that it needs to do that. So you'll always see over here which format, which uh, effect sizes can be computed based on the data that you've entered and which ones cannot be computed. At this point, if I was going to go ahead and run an analysis, uh, both of these studies, the one which were entered, uh, the one which was entered using the first format and the one which was entered using the second format are both going to show up over here and there's really no distinction between them. Coming back over here, however, what I want to do is to insert a series of studies so I can then proceed and show you how the um, how the analyses are uh, are performed. So I'm going over here, I'm going to open that and what I have over here are basically six studies uh, which um, just happen to have been entered using a single format that really is uh, is uh, inconsequential to what we're going to be doing. Uh, before I leave this page, let me show you that there are sev several other options that you have. Um, first of all, if you right click, everything is driven by, by uh, context. So if you right click in the yellow columns, you're going to get options that allow you to customize the yellow columns and um, I can do things like this. I can set the uh, customize the, computer, the, the display of computed effect sizes. There are various effect sizes that I can choose over here and for the sake of argument if I didn't want to look at the raw difference in means I could deselect that and that one would disappear. I also have the option over here of displaying the standard error and or displaying the variance. So for example, if I deselected this one and clicked OK, then for each of these I would be able to look at the variance, but the standard error would be hidden, simply a way of cleaning up the display a, um, a little bit. There's also the data entry assistant, so that for example, this is um, sometimes helpful. If I'm working with any particular set of um, with any study and I double click on one of these cells rather than single clicking the program opens up this cute little sort of display over here which corresponds to the columns so that I can go ahead and enter the information using this tabular format rather than using the columns up here and at the same time down here at the bottom it displays all of the effect sizes um, basically the ones that have been selected up, uh, up here and um, if I then click on any one of these, like standardized difference in means, it shows me the formula that we use to compute that. It's simply another way of getting to some of the displays that I showed you before. One other kind of neat trick is, let's say for the sake of argument, I would rather be entering uh, the two means followed by the two standard deviations followed by the two sample sizes. I can take this column and drag it over here and I can take this column and drag it over here and so now I have the means for groups A and B the standard deviations for groups A and B and the sample sizes for groups A and B and now if I was going to open up this sort of little um, handy table format I have the means followed by the standard deviations followed by the sample size. I actually had forgotten this was even in there so this is kind of nice to, uh, to see. In any event, having done that, we can move on to the next part, which is doing the um, analysis. Later on, um, I guess probably in the next video, I'll show you how you can set this up for situations where uh, some studies or all studies have more than one outcome or more than one subgroup or more than one time point 
or more than one comparator and um, some other uh, interesting features as well. Right now, let's move on to running the analysis. The next step is to run the analysis, um, which we do by clicking over here on the button that says Run Analysis. And uh, immediately the program gives you this kind of a screen. What we're looking at over here is each of the studies, Carroll, Grant, Peck, and so on. For each study, study, we see the standardized difference in means, the standard error, the variance, the lower and upper limit, the Z value, and the P value. We also see that information over here in a schematic form that we generally call a forest plot. Um, one thing that I can do immediately, the program is, is showing the standardized difference in means. I can tell it that I would rather see hedges G, and it switches to that. They are fairly similar to each other. Something else is that this initially is working on a scale of minus 4 to plus 4. I can change the scale that, so that it goes, let's say, from minus 1 to plus 1. And uh, so immediately we can look at these effects and get a sense of, of um, whether or not they're consistent with each other, how precise each of these is, and so on. And finally, down at the bottom, we get the overall effect uh, with its confidence interval. The overall effect is 0.41, and the confidence interval goes from 0.29 to 0.54. Um, initially, the program is showing this using the fixed effect model. We can see that down here, <coughs> where the fixed effect tab is selected. Alternatively, I can click on the random effects model, and then these studies will all remain the same. But now we're looking at a point estimate based on the random effects weights and confidence interval based on the random effect weights. And we also can click both models and see both of them simultaneously. This would be the point estimate and confidence interval using the fixed effect weights. This would be the point estimate and confidence interval using the random effect weights. Um, one thing that's kind of nice is you can click over here and actually see the weights that are assigned to each study uh, under the fixed effect model and under the random effects model. So that over here, for example, if we take a look at this study, which is called Donut, and you uh, may recall that that study had the largest sample size. That study is being given the uh, lion's, sh well, it's being given more weight than any of the other studies. As it happens, um, well, it's always going to happen this way. Under the fixed effect weight, it's being given um, 39, under the fixed effect model, it's being given 39% of the weight. Um, under the random effects model, it's also being given more weight than any of the other studies, but not as much. In other words, under the fixed effect weight, it's being given 40% as compared to, let's say, 8% for this study or 9% for this study. Under the random effects weights, it's being given 23% of the weight as opposed to 12% for this study or 13% for this study. And we can see those distinctions a little bit more clearly if we say over here, show scale relative to um, the maximum. So these things are simply drawing out a little bit. The point is that under the fixed effect weights, the largest study is being given about five times as much weight as the smallest one. Look at the difference between these. By contrast, under the random effect weights, the largest study is being given only about twice as much weight as the smallest one, if you look at the difference between these. So while the largest study still gets more of the weight than the other ones, the differences in weights are less dramatic. They're more moderate under the random effect weights. And this goes back to what we were saying uh, last week, which is that under the fixed effect weights, we're making the assumption that all of these studies are estimating exactly the same quantity. They're all estimating exactly the same true value. And if we're going to make that assumption, then it stands to reason that a study which has 10 times as many people uh, has 10 times as much information and should be given 10 times as much weight. By contrast, under the random effects model, what we're saying is that each of these studies is measuring a, a, a different effect size, that the effect sizes themselves vary. So while it's true that the largest study might be uh, giving a more precise estimate of its population than the small study is giving of its population. Nevertheless, each of these 
is giving us an estimate of a different population effect size. And in trying to combine them and figure out the overall mean, we don't want to give too much weight to the study. Well, this might be a very accurate estimate of the effect size in this study. It's only one study, and it might uh, be an unusually large study. Uh, I'm sorry, a study with an unusually large effect size. We don't want to give it the lion's share of the weight in trying to estimate what the true effect size, what the mean effect size is over all studies. Uh, and by the same logic, we have a study over here which is very small and therefore not very precise. Under the fixed effect weight, we don't give that a lot of weight because it doesn't have a lot of information. We can get the same information more accurately from a large study. By contrast, under the random effects model, we might not have a very precise estimate of the effect size in this particular population, but this is the only estimate that we have of the effect size in this population and therefore we want to give it enough weight that it counts towards the overall mean. In this particular example, we can see that the uh, summary effect size is larger for the fixed effect model than it is under the random effects model. Um, in general, the estimates are going to be different for one model as opposed to the other, but whether the random effects model is lower or higher than the fixed effect uh, model estimate is purely a matter of chance. But the nice thing about this is we can see why, in this particular case, the uh, random effects estimate is lower and the fixed effect estimate is higher. The reason is that there was one study which was especially large. It's this study over here. And just by chance, this study happened to have the largest effect size. Since the study with the largest effect size is being given a lot of weight under the fixed effect model and less weight or less relative weight under the random effects model, under the fixed effects model, this study pulls the effect size all the way to the right, which we can see over here it's pulled up. By contrast, under the random effects model, it's still pulled up, but not quite as forcefully, and therefore the overall effect is somewhat, um, is somewhat smaller. What we also see over here is that the confidence intervals for the random effects model are wider than the confidence intervals for the fixed effect model. That is always going to be the case. And the reason is simply that under the fixed effect model, there's only one source of sampling error. By contrast, under the random effects model, there is that source of sampling error plus, plus an additional source of sampling error. And so if we have uh, more sampling error, obviously we're going to have a, a less precise estimate. The confidence intervals are going to be wider. Um, something else we can do over here is click where it says Next Table. We get, using the fixed effect model and using the random effects model, we get the number of studies, the point estimate. This is the same number that we saw a minute ago. The standard error and variance, the lower and upper limit. We get a z-value and a p-value for a test of the null hypothesis. Coming back to this screen, for example, over here, we see that the p-value is 0 0.001 with a z-value of 3.40. That's for the test of this effect size as compared to the null value of zero. And under the fixed effect model, it's this effect size with this confidence interval under, against the null value of zero. For the fixed effect model, the z-value is 6.4. For the random effects model, the z-value is 3.4. Those are the numbers that we're seeing over here, 6.4 and 3.4. So these tests over here address the question of can we reject the null hypothesis that the true effect size is actually zero. These statistics over here do not address that null hypothesis. Rather, they address the uh, issue of heterogeneity, and that applies to these statistics and to these statistics over here. Coming back over here, we could ask ourselves the question, is there evidence that these effects, that the true effect size varies from one study to the next. Obviously, the observed effect size varies from one study to the next, but the point is each of these estimates is somewhat imprecise. Even if it was the case that the uh, true effect size in all six studies was exactly the same, we would not expect the, the observed effect sizes to line up exactly in a row or in a column because there would be some study-to-study um, -study sampling error. However, we would expect them to fall within a certain range of each other. So the question is, um, this dispersion that we're looking at over here, for example, the fact that this effect size is all the way over here and this one is all the way over here, does that fall within the range of sampling error um, so that we can say that you know it's possible that all the true effect sizes are the same 
and they simply vary one from the next because of sampling error, or does it exceed the amount of uh, dispersion that we would expect based on sampling error, and tell us that it's more likely that the reason we're seeing at least some of this dispersion is because the true effect varies from one study to, to the next. Well, this um, is a test of, uh, of that null hypothesis. The Q statistic is 12.6 with 5 degrees of freedom, 5 being the number of studies minus 1. The p-value is 0.035, and that tells us it's interpreted the way that any other p-value would be interpreted, that if, in fact, um, in the population, all of these effects are exactly the same, then in only three and a half cases out of a hundred meta-analyses of this sort, would we expect to see the kinds of dispersion that we're seeing over here? And therefore, we would reject the null hypothesis that this dispersion simply represents random sampling error and move on to the alternate hypothesis. In, in, other, in, in colloquial terms, we would say that there is evidence that the true effects vary. There is evidence to reject the null that all of the true effects are identical. And um, as we explain or will be explaining over the course of the, um, of the course, uh, the Q statistic depends on a number of things. It depends on how much evidence there is, how many studies there are. It also obviously looks at how much dispersion there is from one study, uh, from one point estimate to the next. But critically, it doesn't simply look at how far apart, at how widely these points are dispersed. It looks at how precise each of the estimates is. So that for the sake of argument, if each of these point estimates had a very narrow confidence interval around it, we would get a much uh, more significant p-value. Uh, to the extent that these confidence intervals are wide, we tend to get a less significant p-value. At the same time, to the extent that the point estimates are more dispersed, the p-value becomes more significant. To the extent that the point estimates line up in a row, the p-value obviously becomes less significant. Um, this Q-statistic over here is used to compute the, the p-value, which addresses the null. It's also used to compute this value called I-squared. I squared tells us that of the precision, of the dispersion that we're looking at, or in other words, we're looking at uh, point estimates here, 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 and so on, what uh, proportion of that dispersion probably represents true dispersion in the effects? In other words, the idea that the true effect actually varies from one study to the next, and what proportion of it is simply sampling error. Um, in other words, if we had a certain amount of dispersion, the I-square might be zero, representing the fact that essentially all of the dispersion that we're seeing can be attributed to sampling error. And we're asking what proportion of this dispersion falls within that expected sampling error range, and what proportion of it exceeds that range. The I-square over here is 58, which tells us that close to 60% of the dispersion that we're seeing in the effect sizes is probably due to real dispersion in the true effect sizes and not simply random um, dispersion due to the fact that each study has a limited sample size. Also, we use the Q statistic and the degrees of freedom to compute uh, Tor squared, which is the, the uh, variance between true study effects. In other words, um, as we saw last week, um, all of the uh, studies, all of the observed uh, effects um, are going to differ from the mean of, the, um, of all of the true effects. Part of that dispersion is due to random sampling error within studies, and part of it represents the fact that the true effects actually vary from the mean true effect. In other words, each study represents a different population, um, if we actually knew the true effect size for each study, those effect sizes would vary. They'd have a mean, a standard deviation, and a variance. That variance is tau square, and that variance is being estimated as 0 0.037. That's the between studies uh, variance. And the reason that that's important is that when we go ahead and assign weights to the studies uh, under the random effects model, the weight that is assigned to each study is 1 over the variance. Under the random effects model, that variance is the vari within study variance plus the between study variance. Uh, another, and in this case, it's going to be the within study variance plus 0.037. Um, finally, uh, we have TOR. 
if tau square is the variance of the true study effects, then tau is the standard deviation of the true study effects. So if you think back to those uh, diagrams that I showed you last week, and there was this uh, normal curve at the bottom that represented the dispersion of the uh, true study effects, that curve was based on the standard deviation of the true study effects, and that is called um, tau. One more thing that we can do over here, as you notice down at the bottom, there is a tab uh, called Basic Stats, which we've been looking at. There's a tab called One Study Removed and Cumulative Analysis, which we'll look at uh, in a different video. But there's also a tab over here called Calculations. And if you click on that tab, you can see how the calculations were actually performed. In last week's exercise, you um, used an Excel spreadsheet to uh, perform these calculations, and the numbers over here should match the numbers that you had on the Excel spreadsheet. For each study, we see the point estimate. For example, for Carol, it's 0.095, and if you want to know where that number came from, you can go back to the main analysis screen, uh, double-click on the um, under Hedges G on the 0.095, and it will show you how that number was computed. The variance for the study is 0.033. You can see how that was computed in the same way. And right now, TOS square um, is being shown as zero because we selected the fixed effect model at the bottom. Um, and therefore, the total variance is simply the same as the within study variance. That's 0.033. The weight is 1 over 0.033. 1 over 0.033 is 30.52. So it's shown over here as the weight. Then, in order to compute the, uh, the um, summary effect for the meta-analysis, we're going to multiply the weight times the point estimate. So we have 30.352 times 0.095, t times w, if this is called t. And then we sum these. If we sum the w's, that is, we sum the weights for all of the studies, we get 244. If we sum t times w for all of the studies, we get 101. And then if we take 101 divided by 244, we get this number over here, which is 0.414, and that's going to be the overall effect. Similarly, coming back to calculations, if we take the sum of the weights, we get 244, and then if we take 1 over 244, we get the variance of the summary effect, which is going to be 0 0.004. And then we take the, the square root of that to get the standard error. We take 0.414, plus 1.96 times 0.064 to get the upper limit. We take uh, 0.414 minus 1.96 times 0.064 to get the lower limit. The z value is going to be 0.414 divided by 0.064. That's going to be 6.47. And then from that, we can get a p-value. The same um, rules apply for the random effects model. If I come back here, and click both models, and then I click random effects. I'm sorry, if I come back here and click calculations and then click random effects, we're going to see the same thing that we saw before, except that now tau square, rather than being 0, is going to be 0.037. And of course, it's going to be the same number for all of the studies. Now, notice when this was fixed, the uh, total variance for the first study was simply the within study variance, so it was 0.095, I'm sorry, so it was 0.033 plus 0, gave us a total variance of 0.033. If I click random over here, then the variance for the first study is 0.033 plus 0.037, which gives us a total variance of 0.070. When we take 1 over 0.070, the weight, which previously had been, um, well, under fixed, the weight had been 30, under random, the weight is now 14. So the weight is only, it's only being given about half as much weight as it was given before. And the same uh, idea applies to all of the studies. Now, if we take W times T, we're taking 14 times 0.095, and that number is going to be 1.34. We do the same for all of the studies. If we add up the weights, we get 90. We add up T times W, we get 32. Uh, 32 divided by 90 gives us 0.358, which is the uh, summary effect using the random effect weights. Um, 
if we sum the weights, we get, again, we get 91 over 90, gives us uh, 0.011, which is the variance using the random effect weights. We can take the square root of that to get the standard error, and then go ahead and compute the lower and upper limit, the z value, and, um, and the p value. So that's the basic idea. Let me just show you over here, coming back to calculations, people generally ask why is this called tor square within when it really should be called tor square between studies. Uh, the short answer is this was a bad idea. We should have called it something else. But the reason that it's called tor square within is that this is uh, the variance between studies within a subgroup. Uh, in a later video, we're going to be looking at what happens when we take all of the studies and group them into subgroups. Tor square is always between studies, but it can be between studies within a subgroup or between subgroups. And so that's why this is called within. I apologize, it certainly is a little bit misleading. I do want to point out, though, that the 0.037 that we see over here is the same as the 0.037 that we see over here. I should probably also point out that while we initially start out working with uh, three decimals, which is good for most purposes, if you're working with uh, variances that are very low, you might want to display more decimals. Or if you're trying to match these computations in Excel, you have the option over here of increasing the number of decimals. Back here on the main screen, you can actually do that. Um, and you can do it for uh, one column at a time. So for example, over here, if I want to customize the basic statistics, I can say that I want to show, um, let's say, three decimals for everything. But for the, uh, for the p-value, I want to show um, more decimals. I mean, by gosh, I've got, I've got a really significant p-value over here, and I want to I want to be sure to show it. So you can you can do that kind of um, you can do that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, we will be coming back to this page and looking at it in more detail in a, a later lesson. But um, for now, let's move on to the high resolution plot. The last thing that we uh, might want to do is to generate a high resolution plot for this uh, set of studies. Now, the basic idea is that we're going to click over here to generate the plot, and whatever is displayed on this screen is going to be sent over to the high-resolution plot. And generally, when making a plot, the most important thing is to keep it as clean as possible, only to keep those columns that we really need. And so we want to remove as many columns from here as possible before going to the high-resolution plot. So, for example, if we had been displaying the weights, we would want to get rid of those. Those are going to be displayed in another format in the plot. Down here, where we're looking at fixed or effects model, fixed effect or random effects models, let's pick the random effect model. Over here, uh, where we have all of these columns, we can get rid of some of them. We're going to click on Customize Basic Stats. And then we're going to, let's say, leave the standardized difference in means and leave the lower and upper limit and leave the p-value, but get rid of the other ones. And um, so we'll click Apply. And uh, okay, let's leave it at that. Then we manage this. Rather than setting the, the font size and things of that sort, um, we manipulate different elements of the plot, and the program automatically expands the plot to make use of all of the available room. So one thing we can do over here is we're going to right click on the forest plot. We click on uh, this thing over here, spacing and forest plot width. If you're working in Windows um, XP, there will automatically be uh, a, uh, a space over here that looks something like this with the various options. On the other hand, if you're working in Windows 7, you'll need to actually pull down over here in order to make these things visible. And we're going to need to fix that at some point. If you click on right buffer, we're talking about the area over here to the right of the forest plot. We don't need that, so I'm going to click remove, and the program expands into that area. Then um, I'd like to have the forest plot take up some uh, more width, so I'm going to click on forest plot width. The um, These blue buttons, uh, 
expand whatever it is we're looking at, and the red buttons um, make them more uh, narrow. So if I click on this, this plot takes up um, more area. Then something else I might want to do is to increase the space between the rows. I'm going to go to row spacing and tell that to, let's see, something like that. Then I can right click on the title. Again, I have to expand this um, size, and I'm going to say this is, let's say, a uh, demonstration demo of uh, means, and I click Apply. Um, I can change the font size for that if I want to. Uh, down here, I have Favors A and Favors B. I can right-click on that, and I can say Favors uh, Control and Favors uh, treatment and apply that. Again, I could change the font size if I wanted to. And when I am satisfied that this is what I want, there's a couple of things I can do. One thing is I can change the color of this. You have colors for printing and colors for slides. You actually can go in and change each of these colors individually. In other words, when it says for printing, that's just a title that I use. Um, but you can go in and, for the sake of argument, change the colors. Let's say for the um, studies, I can use circles. I can use squares. I can use open circles. I'm going to go back to squares, and I can change the color of those guys. I could make them... Um, green if I had a sense of humor um, or I can make them uh, dark blue and then separately you can change the uh, symbol and the color for the uh, summary values. Um, you'll notice over here by the way that the study symbols are proportional to the weight that each study was given in the analysis. If I click one size, all of these become the same size. If I click proportional, then this study over here, you'll remember Donut, had about twice as much weight under the random effects model as compared to um, Stewart, and that's what we see over here. If you look at the actual area of this, you'll see it's twice as, as um, the area is twice as as, um, as large. And we can add a um, a comment down here for the sake of argument if you wanted to put in something about the heterogeneity. You could do it um, over there. One uh, question that people sometimes ask is how to show both fixed effect and random effects on the same on the same plot. If we come back over here, remember that before we sent this over, we had clicked on random effects, and therefore, when we come over here, we're looking at random effects. Back here, if we had clicked on fixed effects. When we come over here, we're looking at fixed effects. And you notice, by the way, that now the relationship between this and this is that this is about four times or five times as large as this one. <laughs> but if you've sent over fixed effects or random effects, then that, that's pretty much what you're limited to in the display. And the good thing about that is because the program knows that you're only dealing with one statistical model, it does not include a column over here that says model, which gives you more room and it's probably going to be uh, better for presentation. On the other hand, for uh, teaching purposes, if we come back over here and click both models, then when we come back over here, um, the program includes a column that says fixed effect. And if we come up here and go to computational options, we can switch back and forth between fixed effect, which we're looking at now, and random effects. And we actually can also show both. And you see the difference in these summary estimates down here. The nice thing about showing just fixed effects or just random effects is that you can see how the weights change as you go from one to the next. Again, the downside of this is that you're taking up more space, and therefore this is a little bit more busy. If I did want to keep this column over here, I probably would want to change the um, width of the forest plot so that it doesn't take up quite as much uh, room, something like that, and so that I have a larger text for the rest of this. Uh, but in general, since I'm going to be presenting either one or the other at any given time, it's a little bit easier to come back here, just choose the model that you want, and then over here, your space is being used more effectively. Once I have this set up, uh, let's say I go back now to the colors for slides, I can say File, um, Export to PowerPoint. 
the program will open up a copy of PowerPoint and insert a copy of this um, of this uh, slide. And um, if you're working in an earlier version of Windows, uh, I'm sorry, an earlier version of PowerPoint, I think up through 2007, the um, the slide will automatically fit the um, the slide in PowerPoint. If you're working in the most recent version, 2010, you'll uh, you'll need to expand the slide the way that I did just over here to have it cover the whole um, the whole area of the slide, and then you can go run a slideshow. Now I notice over here that the lines um, for the anchors are not showing. That's really not a problem with the program. It's really a question of the resolution of the screen. But nevertheless, if it's not showing up in your case, you see it's, it's over here. What we can do is make these uh, lines a little bit wider. I right click over there. I go to line thickness. And over here, we're talking about the lines for the scale anchors. So I can make them just a little bit wider. And now I can actually change the color on them as well as long as I'm here and maybe use a color like this. And now when I um, export this to PowerPoint and go to PowerPoint and open it up, now these lines are visible and if I go to run the slideshow you can you can see them similarly um, uh, and by the way you can also annotate this once you are in PowerPoint for the sake of argument if I wanted to add a, um, a text box or something over here and then annotate that I would have I'd be able to, to do that um, you can actually open up the slide um, this image within PowerPoint and edit it but in general that's not a good idea because uh, these um, icons are over here tend to move around and become misaligned. Coming back to the program, I could similarly similarly say uh, colors for printing, and then I could say file export to Word, and the program will open up a copy of Word. Where the these uh, where this is now visible, and um, what I seem to have done is lost the title. I'm not sure why that happened, but if I come back here and right click on the title, I'll say this is a demo, and apply it, and um, and then I can send it over to Word again. Okay, you finally you can also just save this as a uh, meta file and then import it into Word or into PowerPoint using um, insert uh, object or insert picture. Okay, I'm going to come back to the main screen. Um, and uh, so that's the end of our basic introduction in this example where I used uh, means. Uh, I'm going to get to work now in another video that goes through the same three modules using uh, binary outcomes and using correlations. And then uh, for next week, I hope to have more advanced modules that shows you how to do things like work with more complex data structures, do subgroup analyses, meta-regression, and things of that sort. Um, our website, www.metaanalysis.com. Um, and thank you very much for your attention.